All right. On Extra Mile tonight, we are talking to the Chief of Defense Forces, General Robert Karioki Kibochi, who is with us. And we'll be talking about the Kenya Defense Forces as well as his personal journey through the ranks of a military. First of all, Generali Karibu Sana. I allow you probably to say hi to the viewers of KBC before we begin. I'm very grateful that uh, you could uh, come over uh, to get an interview from the CDF. Yes. Uh, and I'm sure uh, we will have good discussions All right. uh, that will make probably your viewers mm. understand KDF better. All right. Right. And first of all, being the interview, the first interview uh, with KBC, congratulations again uh, on your session to yeah, the Chief of Defense Forces. But let's begin there. Mm -hmm. As a beginner, take us through the journey uh, that you've gone through to mm -hmm. rise to the rank of a Chief of Defense Forces mm -hmm. in the Republic of Kenya. It's a long journey. I don't think we can be able to cover it uh, in a single interview, but I think I can shorten it. Uh, joining uh, the Kenyan Defense Forces uh, as a young cadet in 1979, uh, after my uh, running away from school in Form 5 mm -hmm. at Nyeri High School. And uh, uh, I studied uh, around Gilgil, and as you know, Gilgil has a lot of security uh, forces, and particularly the military. Mm. Uh, a school called, called Kuelel High School that is located right inside uh, one of the uh, infantry battalions, uh, the 5th uh, Kenya Rifles. Mm. Uh, so obviously, uh, the socialization there uh, was one uh, that uh, militarized every one of us, uh, the boys' school. So we joined, uh, I joined in 79, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, obviously uh, rose through the ranks from a young lieutenant uh, to becoming obviously uh, the commander of uh, the Corps of Signals. Mm -hmm. uh, here we have various corps, uh, communications uh, corps uh, is where I belong. Uh, so I served there uh, for, uh, as a commander. Uh, and then uh, obviously rising through the ranks uh, and getting uh, to the rank of a uh, brigadier um, uh, coming here uh, working for General Karangi as uh, a chief uh, strategist and policy uh, mm -hmm. here for close to three years uh, and uh, later on uh, I rose to the rank of Major General uh, and became the his assistant chief mm -hmm. of defense forces in charge of operations uh, plans doctrine and training uh, and that is at the time that we were getting into Somalia uh, so obviously uh, I was uh, responsible for uh, operations uh, planning uh, and also uh, ensuring that uh, we are getting uh, things right mm. uh, for him. Mm -hmm. um, having done that, as you know, uh, I also uh, became the Army Commander uh, after LRD, as you said, mm. uh, in 2015, uh, uh, mm. uh, we had the incident, uh, then 2016, uh, I became the commander of the army, uh, where I did a two-year stint uh, as a commander. Uh, and later on, uh, moving forward, I became the, the vice chief uh, of defense forces, mm -hmm. uh, uh, serving under General Wadele. Uh, and uh, last year, I came to this position, mm. uh, and that's where we are, right. in a very, very summarized way. Mm, mm. Yeah. You talk about, you know, dropping out in Form 5, and I'm here thinking, it is a well-known fact that the General it, not, is Not dropping out, is, running yeah, away. Yeah, yeah running yeah, yeah, away yeah, yeah, in Form yeah, yeah, 5. Exactly. It is a well-known fact that the General is a yeah. well-educated and trained person. Yes. Give us the nexus between rank. The, the nexus between rank, mm. uh, I, think, I think what happened, obviously, mm. is that after I joined uh, the... Uh, the communications uh, core uh, is a uh, is an information system uh, core that provides communications uh, and all communication uh, systems and assets uh, to the entire force. Uh, I, I I got a scholarship uh, to study in the UK, uh, and I did uh, a telecom engineering uh, program, uh, 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 a diploma course mm -hmm. there, and then coming back uh, on promotion to captain. Uh, I headed to India uh, to do uh, a degree uh, in uh, uh, engineering, mm. uh, communications engineering. Uh, and uh, obviously, uh, with that degree, uh, I was able to propel myself to do a master's program uh, uh, in the UK, mm. University of Sunderland, uh, in information systems. Mm. Now, 
having gotten to the level of uh, a full colonel, uh, I realized that I needed to move away uh, from purely being an engineer. Uh, and when I got a chance to study uh, at the National Defense College, uh, I enrolled for a master's degree in international studies mm. uh, within the University of Nairobi. Uh, and uh, obviously uh, that became an area of interest for me uh, because immediately completing this uh, National Defense College, I got appointed uh, by then General Kianga uh, to head uh, an institution that was upcoming, uh, the International Peace Support Training mm -hmm. Center uh, mm -hmm. based in Karen. Yeah. And um, I, I got very interested in issues of conflict management. Uh, so later in life, when I was uh, now uh, a brigadier uh, here, uh, I enrolled for a PhD program, mm -hmm. uh, which I'm almost just completing. All right. Uh, and uh, I'm looking at uh, the role of uh, conflict uh, management, uh, particularly by the collective security institutions within the Horn of Africa. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's where we are, uh, you know, uh, Kibochi the soldier and Kibochi the scholar. All right. <laughs> right. Thank you very much. Yeah. Let's get into the operation of the military and talk about the involvement of the military in what people call civilian uh, duties. You're talking about the Nairobi Metropolitan Services. Right. You're talking about the Kenya Meat um, Commission. Yeah. First of all, why is the military involved in civilian work? I think this is a question that has been coming up uh, in many quarters and uh, I think it's important that you've asked it so that I can be able to elaborate why. Uh, first, uh, and I think it's important uh, to uh, underscore that security and development uh, are very much intricately related. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, uh, I think uh, they are two sides of the same coin. Uh, security can never uh, flourish without development neither can you have uh, development uh, without security. Uh, there is a sense as well that uh, if you read Article 241 uh, of the Constitution, mm. uh, the article provides for the mandates of the Kenya Defense Forces, the Constitution, the 2010 Constitution. And it provides uh, three parts uh, under that particular uh, article. The first part uh, is that uh, the defense forces is responsible uh, for uh, the defense and protection of the sovereignty and territorial integrity uh, of the country and that is the reason we exist uh, to defend mm -hmm. uh, and protect the sovereignty and territorial integrity of mm -hmm. the country mm -hmm. but it goes further uh, to say uh, under part b of that particular article that we shall uh, assist and cooperate with other government authorities mm. uh, in, 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 in areas that uh, the government would want us to, uh, to, to, to undertake. And the third part of that uh, looks at us uh, being able to be tasked to restore peace in any part of this country uh, that has got uh, challenges of security. Mm. Now, this part B, which talks about shall assist and cooperate provides us with a legal framework around which we can be able to work with other uh, government agencies. Mm -hmm. For example, yes. working with the Kenya Railways, for example, uh, to restore the railway line uh, yeah. from Nairobi here to Nanyuki is part of that, uh, is assisting uh, the Kenya Railways uh, to be able to actualize what they're supposed to do. Uh, now, uh, the issue is that the Kenya Defense Forces inherently has a huge reservoir uh, of expertise mm. across the entire spectrum, whether you're talking about engineering, mm -hmm. whether you're talking about medical, marine engineering. And this is a resource uh, that has been uh, developed by the taxpayer like yourself. Mm. And therefore, uh, there is a sense, therefore, that uh, if this resource is available, why shouldn't it be used uh, to uh, develop uh, activities that will benefit the Kenyan people. Mm. Now, this is exactly what has happened with us joining into the Kenya Meat Commission. Uh, Kenya Meat Commission is uh, an area that probably somebody would say, what does the military got to do with the meat? Mm -hmm. But remember, uh, what is happening out there is that the Kenya Meat Commission is not operating because the equipment are down the management principles and processes are, are down mm -hmm. 
And therefore, uh, when uh, we got asked to do this job, we just brought a team, a team of engineers, uh, veterinary doctors that we have around here. Uh, we got a team of IT personnel to go and develop uh, systems uh, and processes for them. And within time, uh, we were able to uh, take it off uh, the ground. Uh, today, mm. if you ask farmers uh, who bring uh, uh, keto, who used to bring keto, to the Kenya Meat Commission, they will tell you they've never been happy because on bringing their cattle uh, at the site, they get to see how much the cattle weighs and how much they're supposed to be paid. Mm. And the farmer just goes home. Within 72 hours, he gets his money. That is what is happening, happening now. That's what happened now. All right. Uh, today, uh, we are very happy as a security sector because all the meat and meat products that we are taking is coming from KMC. Mm -hmm. And this is itself uh, very, very, very important because when you think about uh, warfare and the need to securitize certain products uh, because anyone could use a meat product mm. uh, to contaminate the entire force. Mm -hmm. Now we are very, very, very sure that what is coming into our message for the soldiers whether you're talking about soldiers here, whether you're talking about the police at Keganjo who are training, uh, whether you're talking about the prisons officers, this is something we can trace uh, to the Kenya Meat Commission. Mm, mm. Uh, and, and, and I think uh, uh, even those that have worked there before, uh, and because they're still there, are, are very happy about this. Mm, mm. Uh, they can see uh, something is working, mm. uh, something that has been dead uh, for so many years. Mm. So, so, yeah, so that's the reason why we see ourselves being, being a part of the society. Yeah, the military is part of the society. Right. Uh, and therefore, it should be utilized uh, to uh, support uh, the people mm. that we're supposed to defend. Mm. Mm. Yeah. It is important that I ask, because when we look at the results from, you know, probably the Nairobi Metropolitan Services, mm. the Kenya Meat Commission, yeah. even the rehabilitation, you know, of the railway mm -hmm. and the port, mm. there are visible results, right. that, uh, you know, that are coming out of yeah. these uh, processes. What is this that the military impacts in the character of the people you're engaging mm -hmm. um, that ensures that we have such results coming off from, you know, minimal resources? Because if you compare the budget mm -hmm. that would be used probably to even repair vehicles mm -hmm. uh, in Nairobi Metropolitan Services, mm -hmm. uh, you can't compare mm -hmm. the repairs then mm -hmm. and the repairs being done under uh, NRS. Yes. Mm -hmm. Ab absolutely, absolutely. And I, th I think it's important because um, when, when uh, the Kenya Navy engineers uh, were tasked to uh, refurbish uh, the MV Uhuru, uh, MV Uhuru uh, is a wagon ferry that was mm. built in the, in the 1950s. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been down for close to over uh, 20 years. Uh, they spent only 50 million shillings uh, to revive it, uh, while contractors were asking for 1.5 million shilling, mm -hmm. uh, billion shillings. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason, in my view, is grounded on three and uh, on four areas one is the whole question of discipline and i think uh, what ails uh, most of the institutions that we have is lack of discipline mm. because discipline instills uh, confidence uh, in people uh, it instills uh, a sense of belonging and so that if you're managing uh, a facility uh, you're managing it first of all uh, not because of your own personal interest uh, but looking at the bigger good, uh, the larger good mm. uh, of the country. And I think that is an area to me that separates uh, and puts apart K Kenya Defense Forces from uh, other institutions. Because mm. discipline is instilled right when you join either as a recruit or a cadet officer. Mm -hmm. And that is the Bible that you take with you uh, from that time to the time you leave this service. Mm. Uh, you cannot move away from that. Because the challenge uh, with that is that uh, if you get away from discipline, then there's no way you can run uh, a system uh, of this nature. This is a system that works in teams. Uh, you start with a section, you come mm -hmm. to a pl platoon, you come to a company, mm -hmm. all the way to brigadier, brigades, uh, to formations. Now, if you don't have discipline amongst the people, then it becomes a challenge mm -hmm. uh, to actualize any mission. Mm -hmm. Secondly is integrity. Uh, and I think integrity is also something that is uh, lacking mm -hmm. uh, to a large extent. Yes. Uh, and, and, and one of the challenges of lack of integrity in these institutions uh, informs uh, the way the management of resources is undertaken. 
the lack of trust, uh, you know, amongst the people that you work with. Uh, because if you have integrity, you develop uh, trust. Uh, and to us, trust is important. Mm. Trust is important to the extent that we work in teams. If I cannot trust you uh, when we go for an operation, uh, you might take off. Uh, at the critical moment. Mm. Uh, so I have to have trust on you. And I th think that's very important. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, uh, is selfless commitment. Uh, commitment to the cause. Uh, and and self selfless commitment is what uh, has uh, bound uh, militaries that succeed. Uh, because then uh, you commit uh, to a process uh, that will not benefit you as an individual mm. uh, but will benefit the larger uh, the larger good uh, and i think to me that is something that uh, is is critical the fourth one and i think most important is the whole question of uh, professionalism uh, and uh, professionalism is a critical pillar uh, here in the military mm -hmm. because you cannot be able to uh, to develop an institution if you don't develop the people uh, on a regular basis uh, therefore, training and education uh, in the military is something that we take very, very mm -hmm. seriously. Mm -hmm. be be because the environment changes uh, all the time. And if you don't keep up with the changes that are taking place mm -hmm. in the environment, whether you're talking about technology, mm -hmm. uh, whether you're talking about doctrine in war fighting, if you don't uh, train and be ahead of the curve uh, of the changes, then you lag behind. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think uh, we have perfected in those four areas. Uh, and those are the values in my view mm. that uh, have allowed us to do what we do uh, because when we get a task from the commander in chief and he says to us i want you to turn around kmc in the next six months now that is not something you negotiate with mm. you have to do it uh, within that period of time uh, all you need to do is to get the resources mm -hmm. uh, we turn around uh, kmc with a budget of 650 million mm -hmm. shillings mm -hmm. Uh, there's a time they had been given up 1.5 billion mm. and they couldn't do it mm. and today i don't know whether you've been there you yeah. should go there yeah. uh, and get uh, to the one on landis uh, landis i want you to go to uh, the river, uh, the river yes. and, and look at that facility mm -hmm. uh, and ask yourselves really uh, if you had been there uh, two years ago is a completely different mm -hmm. world uh, which i think those four areas that i'm talking about are critical all right yeah it's very important because you talk about the ills that affect our public service right when it comes to these four disciplines uh, these areas that you've talked about mm -hmm. typically what if a serviceman or a person you have entrusted with that job and is in the military mismanages uh, public affairs what is their fate right and, and i think that's again another area that is important mm -hmm. because uh, we have had instances uh, where uh, some of our own uh, have mismanaged and uh, we have a very clear uh, process uh, of uh, dealing uh, with those kind of uh, behaviors. Mm -hmm. The Kenya Defense Forces Act 2012 uh, is very clear. If you steal uh, from the public coffers, you go through a court martial. Uh, you have no chance. Uh, because we have two ways of dealing with uh, miscreant behaviors. One, you either go through the summary trial, mm -hmm. a summary trial, you appear before your, uh, your commanding officer or uh, any other person who is senior, uh, or you go through a court martial. Mm -hmm. And court martial, for sure, will take you to jail. Uh, and a number of them have been, have been taken to jail. Mm -hmm. So this in itself uh, is, is, is a deterrence uh, for anybody wanting to get into that kind of... Uh, it will not involve the ESCC, it will not involve the No, PCA. no, it will not involve the ESCC. Okay. It will involve our own people. Mm -hmm. uh, our own military police uh, will investigate. Our own lawyers will prosecute the case. We'll just get a judge advocate uh, from the uh, chief justice. Uh, like now we have four cases that are starting on Friday uh, of soldiers who misbehaved in the recruitment process. Uh, and they're now going to court martial. Mm. And for sure, they will end up in jail mm. because the offense is very clearly investigated uh, and properly prosecuted. Uh, and, and, and that is in itself very important uh, so that uh, you, you, you are able to bring everybody online, whether it's the CDF. Mm. The CDF can go to court martial mm. uh, if I make uh, you know, a blunder. Mm. Uh, nobody is immune to this. Uh, and that is what really ensures that we enforce mm. uh, discipline, we enforce integrity, and we enforce uh, 
self-commitment. Uh, All right. Yeah. It's important to talk about probably those surges that will be measured because of misbehaving during the recruitment process. Yes, yes. Because every time you talk about the Kenya Defense Forces to right. the public, right. they always refer to the recruitment process, yeah, yes. how it went. Right. As the man in charge, right. how would you assure the public that mm -hmm. this process is above board and even mm -hmm. the ones that will come after right. will be above board? Right. Mm -hmm. They will be above board uh, and I think uh, it's important that they be because uh, what we have we are having currently mm -hmm. in, in, in our society is that corruption has become a societal menace. Uh, and, and, and this uh, is true uh, that there are people uh, within the Kenya Defense Forces mm -hmm. who have been involved uh, in those practices uh, but then uh, we cannot solve it alone uh, we have to be able to combine forces uh, with the other actors uh, because civilians uh, also uh, do pretend uh, to have the capacity to employ people mm. and they ask for money mm. uh, you heard of a case uh, of, of somebody who came from uh, Kajiado uh, with uh, about 13 uh, recruits that have gotten letters that are fake uh, and bring them all the way to the recruitment center. Mm -hmm. Now, on our end, uh, and I think uh, we have agreed uh, to change the policy. Mm -hmm. Initially, mm -hmm. we were dealing with the, uh, these uh, vices through a summary trial. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody would uh, just be fired, uh, dismissed mm -hmm. from the service without mm -hmm. benefits. Now we are taking them to, uh, to court martial. Mm -hmm. uh, as we speak, there are 13 of them uh, who are lined up for that court martial. And that has sent a very, very strong signal uh, across the entire force that it doesn't matter uh, whether you are uh, an officer of the rank of a colonel, a brigadier, you will be taken through a court martial process mm. and you're going to go to jail. Mm. Uh, there's no tools. Mm. You lose your job and you go to jail. Mm. Uh, so a deterrent measure that uh, during uh, this particular recruitment that took place, mm -hmm. uh, those that were caught up are going to go through it. All right. Yeah. Let's talk about the management of public affairs, just mm. like in the mess KMC, right. rehabilitation of the Siwatoni port, um, right. uh, the Kisumu port. Are we likely to see uh, more engagements with the KDF when it comes to issues of you know public affairs, other than what is in, in mm. public or public what we already know? I, I, I cannot say that there will be, but mm. uh, as I said, we are ready to do any job. Mm. Uh, we join to undertake any task. Uh, that we will be given by the government through the commander in chief mm. if the commander in chief today says uh, i want you to go and uh, undertake some work uh, you know uh, in a particular environment that has got serious challenges we will do it mm. because we have the capacity to mm. do it mm. uh, inherently we have all the capacities required whether you're talking about doctors uh, we have doctors that are now we've taken some of them to the Ministry of Health. Mm. Uh, we have a brigadier and a full colonel who've been working there now since the COVID started. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, in my view, uh, there is nothing uh, wrong uh, by employing the military uh, for good reasons. You are not paying uh, extra uh, to the military mm. uh, to do the job at KMC. You're not paying extra uh, for the engineers to do the railway. Mm. Uh, neither are you paying extra uh, for the, mari the maritime uh, marine engineers mm. from the Navy to do the Kisomo port. Mm. Uh, so basically, really, uh, the government is utilizing its resource. This is a huge resource mm. uh, here in the military that uh, has been uh, brought about because of you, uh, your taxpayers. Why don't you get, uh, mm. why don't you use it? Mm. It, it? It happens everywhere in the world. I just came back from Pakistan mm -hmm. uh, about uh, two, three weeks ago. And exactly what we are doing is what they do. They build roads, uh, you know, building a road from Kashmir down to the southern mm -hmm. part, a thousand kilometers stomach road. Why can't we do that? We should be able to do that. Right. Uh, and we're looking forward to do it okay. uh, in the future. Quite interesting. Right. You talk about the number of experts you have here because it is a well-known fact that yeah. KDF has some of the best engineers, right. some of the best trained um, yes. doctors. Right. And, I'm, and now I'm into the aspect of revenue generation. Right. Is there a plan within KDF yes. to use this expert right. for the sole purpose of revenue generation? Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm. In fact, uh, what we are doing currently is yes. looking at... Uh, establishing um, uh, a Lindsay uh, construction company uh -huh. uh, and uh, because we have these engineers uh, and what we needed to do is to ensure that we are able to undertake tasks uh, in, in in areas that are conflict uh, ridden for example mm -hmm. if you give a task uh, to a contractor 
uh, like now we are doing, uh, the government is doing the road from, uh, from Hindi uh, all the way through, through Ijara uh, to Garissa. Mm -hmm. Now, the contractor, the civilian contractor, uh, can never be comfortable uh, to undertake the road construction because of the uh, insecurities. And therefore, we have had to provide security for them uh, to undertake uh, that road. What would happen if we had a construction company mm. uh, that is managed by, by military people? They would not need to be protected by anybody. Yeah. They would do the job yeah. uh, and it would be cheaper for, uh, for, for the government uh, because you will know that uh, we are working on this uh, border fence uh, from uh, uh, Mandera uh, all the way to Kyunga uh, using contractors. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, what we have looked at and seen is that we can do it ourselves at a cheaper cost, much faster, uh, and we'll also be providing security mm. uh, in the same areas. Mm. Uh, and this has happened again, uh, as I said, e even in the U.S., uh, the U.S.-Mexico border, uh, the border between Afghanistan and Pakistan done by the military. These are areas that we can be able to, mm. to work on now. If we do generate uh, revenue, isn't it good for the government? I mm. think so. Mm. Instead of us just becoming a, a consumer uh, of uh, budgetary resources, why can't we utilize uh, that capacity uh, to generate? Contribute at Contribute. the budget, yes. Mm. Right now we are working on, uh, as you know, we are producing dehydrate, dehydrated uh, vegetables mm -hmm. uh, at Gilgil. The Gilgil Food Processing Factory. Okay. Uh, recently, uh, you saw us uh, taking uh, tonnage of them uh, to Mozamb uh, Mozambique mm. uh, when there was this volcanic uh, activity. Mm. Uh, th th these are these are areas that uh, I believe, because we have already attained self-sufficiency in dehydrated vegetables. Our soldiers in uh, Somalia, in Boni Forest, uh, consume these products. We also generate uh, employment because these vegetables come from farmers uh, around Akuru, Yandarwa. Mm -hmm. So it, it, is, it, is, it, is, it is the best thing to do. Mm -hmm. It is the best thing to do, mm -hmm. uh, including the Kenya Shipyards Limited uh, that uh, uh, was recently commissioned. Uh, you know there are two of them, uh, one in Mombasa, one in Kisumu. Uh, the amount of boats that this shipyard can make for fishermen in these areas would be great mm. instead of fishermen having to use canoes uh, that uh, are not safe uh, we can be able to generate a lot of these boats for for for, for, for fishermen mm. uh, around inland, water, inland waters and also uh, the, the the indian ocean mm. uh, and 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 to 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 look at that uh, broadly mm. then you're looking at uh, the national defense becoming a public good okay. uh, a good that people will you know identify themselves mm. with mm. Uh, moving forward all right quite an interesting one uh, ulinzi construction company right. is that on course um have yes. you already begun it, it is on course okay. uh, it is on course uh, we have already uh, had it registered approved by the national security council mm -hmm. uh, we are now in the process of uh, getting the relevant uh, equipment uh, because the idea here is to uh, to separate what we call combat operations you know combat engineers mm. we have a combat engineering brigade in anyuki what what does it do it does provide uh, combat engineering support to the fighting force mm. opening up roads mm bridges you know uh, digging water you know uh, in, the, in the in the bushes there uh, and, and 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 we have this construction mainly focusing on horizontal constructions and vertical buildings mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. uh, and the idea uh, is also to make use of the national youth service mm -hmm. as you know uh, the law uh, provides that uh, the national youth service is our reserve mm. Uh, the national service is, is is meant to be the reserve today if we went to war and we wanted to generate more soldiers uh, we would go to the national youth service mm. uh, to be able to get uh, the youth uh, to be able to undertake uh, training for them to go to the front mm. uh, so we we think uh, very seriously that uh, making use of these young people will also create employment uh, for them uh, 
because today when the national aid service uh, graduates uh, commission from gilgil uh, they have nowhere to go mm. uh, so we need to create avenues uh, for them to be absorbed mm. uh, within this 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 kind of infrastructure mm. that we are creating mm. Mm. yeah I think generally the public sees the military uh, generally from the aspect of combat. Yes. Uh, you know, the people we send to war, the people yeah, who defend absolutely. the territorial integrity right. of, of our country. So mm. how would you respond to those who are saying the government is slowly militarizing public service? I, I think they, they are off the mark. Okay. Uh, they are off the mark to the extent that if you think at it uh, from a very broad perspective, there is nothing to militarize. Uh, for example, look at NMS where General Badi is, uh, and he's been there, and he's done a great job. Uh, he's, he's been able to fall back on us, uh, the military instrument, to support him in areas that he has had serious challenges. For example, uh, they never had any vehicles there that were running. Mm -hmm. uh, we use our Kenya Army electrical and mechanical engineers in Kahawa uh, to go out there uh, in their workshops, turn it around, uh, and we were able to come up mm -hmm. with over 200 vehicles for him. Now, is that good for the Nairobian or is it bad? It's good. I think it's good. Mm. Uh, and uh, the, the idea really is to, is to also uh, transform the culture, uh, the working culture, uh, the ethics uh, of the people that we are working with. Uh, and, and, and I believe in my view, uh, looking at what is happening at uh, KMC, uh, the civilians there were very apprehensive when we came in mm -hmm. uh, because they thought we were coming there with orders, we were coming there to beat our people. No, we are not. We are coming there mm -hmm. to be able to get them to learn that you can actually become much better. Yeah. And I see a situation whereby uh, once you have uh, transformed that culture, uh, it is very easy for that culture to be adopted mm. uh, into into the future. Mm. Uh, if, if you look at uh, most of the companies in the, in the, in the, in the, in the Western world, in mm -hmm. the U.S., military officers uh, who are either retired uh, are the ones who lead them mm. uh, and for good reason because the culture and the work culture and the work ethics uh, in the military is, 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 is very particular you know we come to work at six in the morning we have to work uh, you know don't hang a coat and go you have to be here and, and work and you know put in as much time as you can yeah. uh, to be able to deliver uh, effects so, so I think that is what we're trying to do. Mm. Uh, there, is, there is a sense that uh, a number of Kenyans are very happy with what is happening. Mm. Uh, but there are those who are hell-bent uh, on continuing the bad ways who would want to use this militarization uh, as, as, as an mm. excuse mm. Uh, for the military uh, not to deliver. All right. Let's talk about the pride of Kenyan defense forces. We have a first you know major general a lady in kenya mm -hmm. um and of course the number of uh lady officers that you promoted to the level yeah. of brigadier right is there any other country in the commonwealth mm -hmm. um that has you know uh such honors in the sense that we have the first major general mm -hmm. uh, a lady right yeah no they're there they're, they're there in the commonwealth uh, in uh, in a number of countries okay. uh, within the commonwealth they're, they're lady major generals uh, and yes, we were lucky to be uh, also in that uh, park. I know, for example, in Australia, there's a lady uh, general who was commanding uh, forces in, Le in Lebanon, mm -hmm. uh, UK, uh, they're there, uh, South Africa, particularly in the uh, in these uh, specialized fields like mm -hmm. medical, mm -hmm. uh, they're there, they're there. But we uh, are lucky that uh, our major general. Is a general staff officer, mm. uh, a service officer. Mm. Uh, she is a combatant officer, uh, trained uh, from a cadet uh, up to the level that she has reached. Mm -hmm. uh, as you said, we now have uh, four uh, brigadiers who have just uh, been promoted uh, in Ligo, uh, commanding the International Peace Support Training Center. Uh, and I think uh, uh, moving forward, uh, we see a number of them coming in. Mm. Uh, they are now maturing. Mm -hmm. Uh, into uh, I I into into the senior positions mm. uh, that uh, I think will allow them to 
get into the higher positions mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. yes. And I'm also aware that uh, Major Steplin Nyaboga won the UN Military Gender Advocate of the Year yes. 2020 award. Right. Which of course puts KDF yes. at an elevated position when you compare to other disciplined right. forces. Right. Right. The issue of gender always crops up. I mm -hmm. think you've seen that particularly cropping up in the police force. Right. Um, how would you say probably and uh, explain mm -hmm. to us how mm -hmm. you know the military is faring in terms of gender elevation? I think gender elevation uh, has been taken very, very uh, positively mm -hmm. uh, within the military, uh, and for good reason. We have a number of areas that uh, uh, various gender uh, can work. For example, uh, the male gender uh, in the military is highly combatant, mm. uh, and these are the people that you want to go to Somalia, uh, for good reason. Uh, but there are other supportive areas that the female gender can be very useful for example in areas of uh, surveillance uh, operating surveillance mm -hmm. systems mm -hmm. uh, areas of information uh, uh, systems uh, areas uh, of uh, supplies management uh, they are very very important uh, and because the force cannot fight uh, without these aspects mm -hmm. uh, we have realized that uh, we need to mainstream gender uh, and we started by developing a gender policy and I think we are the only military currently uh, in the continent with a written gender policy mm -hmm. uh, that focuses on mainstreaming gender into decision-making processes. Uh, so uh, Yaboge has done a good job uh, and by the way she's from my core, she's a signaller, ah. uh, so I'm very very proud of her. <laughs> uh, the, the other issue is, uh, is that uh, you might be aware of the UN resolution mm. 1325 mm. Mm. of the year 2000 that requires that uh, gender mainstreaming uh, be done across uh, all sectors. Uh, so her working in the UN uh, and, 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 and ensuring that she became the top uh, has put us also in a very uh, in a very good position because we have the gender policy we are mainstreaming gender as you see uh, the, the, the ladies that we are bringing into the uh, into the force we we just uh, com uh, promoted close to 17 full colonels mm. uh, ladies uh, in the last uh, promotion mm -hmm. uh, and these are the ones that i see personally in the next uh, few years when you're out of this place they'll be very senior mm. uh, you never know uh, one of them could actually sit uh, as a cd yeah. yeah it can happen all right yeah they are fast obviously when we talk about our kenyan absolutely, defense forces absolutely. talk about our global ranking because it, it's it's very important that probably kenyans appreciate how we rank in terms of our military might i, I think ranking uh, in my view uh, from a military perspective mm. uh, is, is 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 something that you cannot be able to quantify okay. especially from a military point of mm. view mm. because then you need criteria mm. uh, you need to say for example do you become strong because you have many soldiers mm. uh, within the region for example there are countries that have got more soldiers in terms of numbers than we have does that make us weak i don't think so mm. because uh, we use uh, force multipliers uh, we have uh, equipment mm. uh, that are that, that 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 can perform much more than having a very big force uh, and therefore uh, you need to look at the construction of the forces mm -hmm. uh, you could have south sudan could have so so many hundred militias hundred thousand does that make them strong mm -hmm. uh, no uh, you need to look at the training the professionalism uh, of the force yeah. you need to look at the equipment that the force is mm -hmm. using mm -hmm. uh, and therefore uh, i would say uh, that we are not in a position that you can say Kenya is number six or number five or number you we are in a position where we can be able to actualize our mandate mm. uh, effectively mm. uh, based on our professionalism uh, based on our equipping uh, based on our training uh, we are capable of executing any mandate whether that mandate is a conventional war or a symmetric war. Mm. All right, CDF, mm. talk to us about the National Defense University, right. Kenya, right. that has been awarded a charter by President Uhuru Kenyatta yeah. just recently. Exactly. And I'm interested in the curriculum, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, being offered uh, in That's this university, right. noting that there are people who also come from outside Kenya right. to come and study there. Yes. But equally, right. um, w why is it so special, the National mm -hmm. Defense University, right. uh, Kenya? Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. 
thank you thank you very much indeed uh, the the national defense university kenya um as you uh, might know is a specialized university mm -hmm. uh, under article 24 mm -hmm. the Edu Edu education act and uh, specialized to the extent that uh, it, it it will not compete in any way uh, with the local universities that are offering degrees mm. uh, to undergraduates uh, the university also will not admit uh, students who have completed uh, all levels mm. directly okay unless you're coming in as a cadet oh uh, because you know we are recruiting cadets uh, now from uh, form four students uh, who have just completed mm. and also we have a master's uh, rather a, a degree uh, first degree program for cadets so we have two types of cadets mm -hmm. now we have those who are coming in with a degree uh, who are training for one year then you have these youngsters uh, who are coming from all levels who will do uh, three years mm -hmm. now uh, it is therefore uh, a very specialized uh, university on that sense on the other sense it is uh, going to offer specialized programs focusing on defense and national security uh, the national defense college uh, that has been around here for over 10 years uh, would be one of the constituent colleges uh, as, 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 as a constituent college of mm -hmm. that university mm -hmm. offering a master's degree and phds in national security and strategy and then you have uh, a defense staff college also uh, in uh, in current uh, that has been offering a program uh, on postgraduate uh, studies in defense and, 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 and strategy uh, from Nairobi University now the university will be offering that mm. uh, to our officers and those who come from other countries and also uh, in future uh, we might want to be admitting also uh, uh, journalists like yourself mm. uh, to come and train uh, and focus on those areas of national uh, mm -hmm. security and strategy mm -hmm. we will also have uh, a bachelor's degree two bachelor's degree offering uh, colleges one is the one at the kenya military academy mm. uh, that i'm saying trains cadets uh, who are coming in from all levels and those who are coming in from uh universities mm -hmm. and uh we'll be offering uh, from this university uh, a bachelor's degree but bachelor of science degree in defense and security studies mm -hmm. a bachelor's degree then we have a defense forces technical college uh that is in embakasi mm -hmm. which is which is going to be offering a number of courses on diverse areas uh aeronautical engineering uh, information systems uh civil uh mechanical uh, all of them will be offered from there. Mm -hmm. You must uh, be aware also that we are establishing uh, a level six hospital at Kabete, where we are going to have a college, a military college of medicine, mm -hmm. uh, again offering uh, medical related uh, uh, degrees. Uh, and these are people who will be coming in from within this country who are practitioners themselves, mm -hmm. uh, or from outside the country and who are practitioners. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't, uh, therefore, conflict with the local universities. Mm. So we, therefore, for example, when I got my master's, I got a master's in international studies uh, from Nairobi University. Anybody now from next year, uh, when we start the program uh, next year, will be getting the degree through the National Defense University, uh -huh. where the president and commander-in-chief is the uh the chancellor mm. uh the vice chancellor has just been uh, named uh, lieutenant general mwangi uh, and i happen to be the chair of the council mm -hmm. of the university mm. as the cdf yeah right all right where is the farthest uh, in terms of you know um the other officers who come from outside right. other countries to come train yes. the national defense college and the people who will come to the national defense university Kenya. Right. yes uh, where's the farthest in terms of studies yeah in terms of where uh, these the, soldiers have traveled from no, they, to come they, they go from very far right okay. now we have uh, as we speak today we have uh, uh, students from pakistan oh. uh, we have german students who are uh, who are officers who are there uh, from india uh, we were expecting one from britain uh, or you know for the covid uh, we also send our students there mm -hmm. uh, right now uh, when i came from pakistan i got slots uh, for officers who are now leaving 
uh, to go to uh, that university. Mm. Uh, the colonel here is just leaving in the next few uh, days to the UK mm -hmm. uh, to what they call the Royal College of Defense Studies, uh, which brings together not just uh, military but civilians mm -hmm. from uh, across government and also from industry, mm. uh, people who work in industry. And that's where the meeting of minds, mm. uh, you know, takes place mm. at the strategic level. All right. All right. All right. Let's talk about the operation Lindanchi mm -hmm. in Somalia. Mm -hmm. How are we doing so far? We are doing okay, mm -hmm. uh, I have to say, because uh, as you know, we've been around there for uh, 10 years, uh, end of this year, mm -hmm. uh, after 2011 when we got in. And 20 years has been a long time. Uh, we have achieved uh, tremendous successes. Mm -hmm. uh, successes, one, in degrading the threat. Okay. Uh, because the threat of Al Shabaab, as you know, uh, when we started this fighting, uh, was quite uh, a menace, uh, even to us uh, in the country. Uh, it was quite a menace. And therefore, the indicators are very clear that the threat has been, mm. has been uh, degraded. Has it... Uh, uh, been eliminated absolutely not uh, there's still a lot of work to be done and what has happened uh, over that uh, 10 years the countries in Amiso, uh, kenya being one of them the five countries uh, have gotten to a point where uh, they've done uh, a good job but we need to move from what we are currently doing uh, to undertaking stabilization stabilization meaning we need to start having the somali national security forces themselves taking the war uh, that is remaining mm. uh, under uh, the tutelage uh, and mentorship uh, of uh, ourselves who are there uh, and for good reason because there is no way we are going to be there forever mm. but we can't live until the conditions are right mm -hmm. because the gains that have been made for these 10 years mm -hmm. uh, will be lost mm -hmm. so what has happened is that the united nations security council has uh, initiated a process of re engineering and restructuring AMISOM mm. okay uh, to the extent that uh, AMISOM today is majorly a military force but what you need now is to bring in other dimensions mm -hmm. you need to br bring in civilian actors uh, who are going to construct schools who are going to do uh, health centers uh, who are going to do roads uh, because there are no roads out there mm. Uh, who are going to bring water uh, to the people uh, and that is critically important thirdly is that AMISOM has been funded through a very strange mm -hmm. uh, system mm -hmm. where the European Union provides the resources to the African Union through a bilateral mm -hmm. arrangement uh, but what has come out now is that this mission must be taken over by the United Nations Security Council and becomes a UN mission mm -hmm. okay so that it has predictable funding it has predictable capabilities that will be able to deliver the final uh, successes uh, for uh, for somalia mm. it is in our interest uh, as a country uh, to have a stable somalia uh, because if you have an unstable neighbor you will never go to sleep mm. uh, you'll always be awake mm. so we are very very keen to support uh, that effort uh, we've had engagement uh, with the U UN security teams that are doing this, the African Union, uh, and we are hoping that uh, uh, by the end of December, uh, a decision will have been made mm. on how AMISOM will be reconfigured mm. uh, into uh, into a multi multi what do you call it multi dimensional mm. force, mm. Uh, a force that will be able to undertake the tasks that we undertook ourselves when we went to Sierra Leone, mm. okay, where uh, a force had all these capabilities uh, to be able to ensure that you hand over uh, the responsibilities uh, to, to the government mm. uh, of Somalia. Mm. The question of predictable funding is something, it has been President Uhuru Kenyatta's clarion call yes, in yes. most of the international meetings Absolutely. that he has done. Yes. Um, and again, bringing in the question of mm. people who argue the war uh, or uh, the Operation Linda NG is costly to the Republic, mm -hmm. one in terms of costing, yes. uh, in terms of funding, right. and number two, in terms of the soldiers mm -hmm. we have lost mm -hmm. inside Somalia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I think there is no, there is no doubt that uh, war is costly uh, in whatever character, uh, in whatever form. 
uh, war is costly, uh, but it is costlier and catastrophic mm -hmm. not to engage in mm -hmm. war. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have been pushed to uh, to the corner uh, where uh, the country uh, employs uh, the instrument of last resort, uh, because the military instrument of national power mm. is the instrument of last resort. Uh, having tried diplomacy, negotiations, uh, you as a country decide that this is the last instrument. Now once you engage in it, uh, it, it is important uh, for uh, people to understand that it is going to be costly, mm. uh, both in human life and uh, in, uh, in, in, in the economy. Mm. But it is costlier if you don't engage. Uh, for example, if we didn't have uh, troops in Somalia, uh, if we didn't have troops uh, from Mandera to Kyunga, uh, we will not be sleeping. Mm. Uh, or they will find us here in Nairobi, isn't mm -hmm. it? Mm -hmm. Nobody wants that. You want to fight them as far, far, far ahead as possible mm -hmm. so that you can let the country uh, develop and continue, uh, you know, with what we do. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is why uh, I was saying that uh, we have some of the finest uh, soldiers in this uh, KDF uh, who uh, undertake a lot of work mm -hmm. uh, in those areas uh, to ensure that the country is not... Uh, uh, peace is not disturbed mm -hmm. and i'm very very uh personally very happy mm -hmm. with the with the troops mm -hmm. uh, that i normally visit uh, very often they're doing a great job all right yeah as we wind up let's talk about the eladi attack six years on um roughly six years on after yeah. that very horrible mm -hmm. um attack without mm -hmm. going into the tactics yes. or, or the tactical efforts that you're putting right what has the kdf done to ensure mm -hmm such a horrible attack doesn't mm -hmm. happen ever mm -hmm. again mm -hmm. uh, to the soldiers mm -hmm. um, protecting this country mm -hmm. inside Somalia? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's also a good question and I think it's important uh, for Kenyans to also know uh, that uh, this was one of the worst uh, uh, attack that uh, we have suffered uh, as, a, as a KDF mm. uh, and, and, and uh, we have had to relook at what could we have done better mm. okay uh, and uh, that is the essence of having a uh, a force that uh, is on a continuous learning curve and what has happened is that the enemy has been mutating to the extent that when we go to somalia uh, the worst that we could get from the enemy was ieds on the road mm. Uh, there was no time that we had experienced a vehicle born IED. Okay? And therefore, when this vehicle born IED came, uh, which caused a lot of damage, we realized that we had to rethink and be ahead of the enemy. And this happens all the time with, uh, uh, with war uh, encounters. Uh, and therefore, force protection uh, became one of the major uh, areas uh, of engaging in. I came in as the Army Commander at the time uh, and we made sure that all these uh, forward operating bases were hardened. You know, you have to harden them. Mm. Harden them to the extent that this vehicle does not get a chance of in intervening into, the, mm. uh, into, into, into this facility. Mm. Uh, and therefore, uh, and I think you uh, can attest to the fact that uh, since uh, Elade uh, and Colbio which came together almost at the same time we've not had those kind of mm. things and we, we will not have them mm. uh, secondly uh, we have continuously um, worked on how do you ensure that we are ahead of them uh, all the time today they're using drones uh, to carry uh, IEDs which they can come and drop mm -hmm. on yourselves so what does that uh, tell you you have to be able to look at how do you harden mm. uh, you are uh, you know overhead protection from aerial uh, from aerial attacks, attacks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so there is a continuous learning uh, in this in this in this engagement and i can assure you uh, that uh, all these lessons that mm -hmm. we learn mm -hmm. we translate them into doctrine uh, we take them to tra training institutions to recruit training school in uh, eldoret we take them to cadets and so that when they leave those institutions they are already uh, attuned mm. uh, to what would happen mm. uh, mm. so yes uh, it was uh, uh, a terrible uh, 
uh, attack. Uh, did we learn from it? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, and we are now better uh, placed uh, than, than before. All right. Yeah. There have been claims that they are prisoners of war out of a lade mm. attack. And I think you've seen one family in Tanzania mm. um, that is still talking about their kid mm -hmm. that is still mm -hmm. uh, in Somalia as mm -hmm. a prisoner mm. um, of war. First of all, mm. um, have you received you know such claims that mm. they are you know prisoners of war mm. after the lade attack? Mm -hmm. And secondly, mm -hmm. are there efforts to repatriate them back mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. the country? Mm -hmm. Yes. I think it's a good question you're asking, uh, and we've had uh, to see these uh, social media mm. uh, events. But I think it's important for the people to understand mm. that uh, in war, what you have is missing in action. Mm. Because, for example, when uh, the attack took place in Elade, mm -hmm. uh, in the manner that it did, what happens is that the cohesion of the force breaks, isn't it? Yeah. People break, they go different directions. And therefore, within that melee, uh, you get uh, people who will be missing in action. Mm -hmm. Either those people are dead, or they've been injured, okay, or they've been taken captive. Mm. And therefore, you cannot be very sure to say that you have a prisoner of a war. Okay? Mm -hmm. So, what we've been doing ourselves. Uh, is, is to ensure that we interact with uh, the local people, okay, to try and get to understand uh, whether we still have people uh, in Somalia mm. uh, who have either died, because even if they're dead, we have the responsibility mm. of getting them out uh, and bringing them back. Uh, so we take this as propaganda, okay. which really uh, is intended to, one, demoralize the Kenyan people, mm -hmm. And secondly, uh, to also uh, demoralize the fighting force. Uh, so yes, we have had instances where we have people missing in action. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, but are we doing something about it? Absolutely. Mm. Uh, what we are doing is uh, classified for mm. good reason. Mm. Yeah, but we are doing something about All it. Right. Yeah. As we wind up, because there's the name of this segment is Extra Mile. Mm. What does General Robert? Mm -hmm. Kariuki Kibochi, the mm -hmm. chief of the defense forces, do when he's not in his office or when he's not discharging <laughs> the duties of CDF? Yeah, I, I think the CDF uh, really has also to get uh, out there mm -hmm. and uh, become a Kenyan. Okay. Uh, and the CDF, uh, as I said to you earlier, uh, comes from uh, a farming area of Jandarwa. Yeah. Uh, so the CDF does the farming. Uh, I love uh, to see Keto uh, mm -hmm. around. Uh, and you know very well that uh, Nyandarwa has got the best uh, mm -hmm. uh, ship. Uh, so uh, if you happen to pass around, you'll be able to see the CDF <laughs> doing exactly that. All right. Looking at uh, cows and sheep and things like that. All right. Secondly, uh, the CDF uh, is, a, is, a, is a grandfather. Uh, so I've got two uh, grandchildren. Uh, so I also have an opportunity to... Uh, to stay with them right. uh, when you're not uh, in the in the in the office. Thirdly, uh, the CDF loves uh, to keep it. Mm. Uh, I think uh, all the Kenya Defence Forces people know that they have to fit, be fit mm. uh, to be able to be mission ready. Mm. Uh, so we normally run with my soldiers. Uh, when I get time, uh, I, I, I go to a unit and we just have a run uh, with them, uh, which I think is a good thing. They also mm. get to understand mm. uh, their CDF as, mm. a, as a person uh, who also can do some things that, uh, you know, people think he's an old guy, mm. but he still can do mm. it. Mm. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry, anyway, sorry. That was easy. <laughs> <laughs> You've been talking to the Chief of Defense yeah. Forces, uh, Robert Karioki Kibochi, the man in charge of our Kenya Defense Forces. Keep watching KBC because indeed, Kenya 